I love to read. Everyone in my family loves to read. I have two young daughters, and we read to each other every day. This may have something to do with the fact that we don't have a television in the house. However, it's interesting that these days I find myself more and more reading on screens. I think electronic books are a wonderful innovation. I can carry an entire library in my pocket, and I can take one author's ideas and relate them to another's, and sometimes think of a new idea. But is this innovation? One of my favorite books on the topic of innovation is called Crossing the Chasm, and it deals with the difficulty in taking the promise of a new technology to an early adopter market that will value it. But once you've done that, another similar book called The Innovator's Dilemma talks about the paradox of success and that doing the right thing might be wrong because what you did in the past to be successful, if you keep doing it the same way, may lead to failure. And so perhaps it's our own experience that teaches us the most that the innate ability and desire to learn begins at birth and we're naturally curious and naturally innovative beings. But we are also social beings, and our ideas do not form in a vacuum. They're built on other ideas. And the more that these ideas can mix and be added to and shared, the more valuable they become. Stephen Johnson, in his book, Where Do Good Ideas Come From, said that connectivity is the engine of innovation. And Matt Ridley, I think, nailed it when he called the topic promiscuous ideas. Because you see, invention doesn't really happen the way it's told to us in stories. The lone inventor with the epiphany moment. For the last hundred years, our society has moved from the industrial age to the information age to the knowledge age. And increasingly today and in the future, our contributions to society, our valuable innovations, will be built from a combination of our skills and things that we have known in the past and our ability to adapt and learn in the future. Because the pace of innovation and the pace of change in our world is going faster and faster. It's also true that we are more and more connected than ever before in history, and we have access to vast amounts of information available to us on the internet. So if innovation over time is difficult, and change is coming faster and faster, and doing the right thing can be wrong, what's the answer? because sometimes the path of least resistance may actually be the right way to, to go. Picasso once said, computers are worthless for they can only give answers. It's important to know what is the question to ask. And the most valuable question to ask is how to make an idea valuable. I maintain that this is the true definition of innovation. The ability to take an idea and create something of inherent value from it. Access to information is merely a tool. Synthesis, context and meaning, reducing to practice, and the refinement, these are delivery outputs from the innovation process. At Synapse, we use this process to connect, to connect people, to form teams, to connect brains, to form a learning organization. We're called Synapse because in the human nervous system, the synapses are the connections between the individual elements of the network. Information passes from one neuron to another to communicate intent and action. This is similar to our role in connecting innovative ideas to becoming innovative products. As an example, this is a fluoroscopic imaging technology that we developed to detect microarrays, which are essentially microscopic tiny test tubes that each individually hold a unique strand of DNA. The goal is to see what kind of chemicals might bond with each of these test tubes. And so, as in genomics, there are billions of possible combinations. The name of the game is scale and density. The more test tubes per test, the better. The problem with this paradigm comes in that as the features of the chip become so small that the wavelengths of fluorescent light are no longer sufficient to discriminate them, the whole paradigm breaks down. So we asked the important question. When this chemical reaction is occurring inside these micro test tubes, you've got valent shells exchanging electrons, that's basically electricity. So what if we could monitor this electrical reaction instead of having to use it all done in the photonic spectrum? And from this one insight, we 
refocused the organization on a disruptive innovation, and it transformed the industry. And today is the basis for a new paradigm in genomic analysis, because we created an equivalent technology that for an order of magnitude lower cost and faster response time could enable it to be placed not just in a few big pharmaceutical research labs, but on every university workbench throughout the world. This is the process that we use as a paradigm for teaching and connecting people in an organization. We call it the three pillars of the learning organization. First off, the number one impediment to risk in a collaborative organization is fear of failure. So to be collaborative, you must investigate and be able to foster a culture of innovation, fostering uh, risk, and at Synapse, we take play very seriously. Play is a way to break down barriers, to uh, foster communication amongst groups, and to enable a new perspective on sometimes a seemingly intractable problem. The process of commercial innovation must proceed from concept to a product in a meaningful fashion. Along the way, we take big problems, break them into smaller constituent parts, and then attack them in parallel using best guesses and educated decisions about how to move forward at every step. Along the way, we take feedback from as many possible sources so as to make sure that we're not biasing our own judgment. At Synapse, we are devout advocates of the prototype. Tom Kelly said that, of IDO said that a prototype is worth a thousand pictures. But more than that, it's a kinesthetic process. It's learning by doing. And this is an important lesson. We learn more by doing than by thinking. And so the last step of the learning pillar is that it must include a mandate to teach. Because in teaching, it forces your brain to reconstruct memory in such a way as to explain something to someone else, like doing, but once removed. Therefore, the need for specificity and specific instructions is much higher, effectively making like a process constraint that improves the output of the work. We believe that a healthy learning environment is comprised of two complementary yet opposing sides, yin and yang, comfort and conflict. An innovator needs a comfortable space in which to step outside their comfort zone, test the limits, try and see what works and what doesn't. And yet you can't become too comfortable because in the business of learning for a living, there are deadlines, and schedules and dependencies and things that might ultimately mean failure. So a happy medium. When you're continually reaching for growth and changing, it's very important to know who you are, what you stand for, what you do, and what you don't do. If you protect the core by implementing constraints and living within the core values that you set for your organization, it will help you maintain focus. And finally, it's our goal to select input from as many possible sources as possible. And so the structure must be configured to accept input from every level. Insight and skills can come from the most amazing places. And so the structure must and facilitate collaboration. So there you have it, a template for innovation that can be used inside your organization through the lenses of process and structure and culture. I hope you find this useful. Good luck to you, and happy innovating. Thank you.